Um, what I want to do is I'm going to put you all to work, actually, a little bit this morning, and I want you to help me solve a problem and, uh, that I see replete in many organizations. Over about a decade and a half, I've been in well over 300 organizations now and applying these ideas and thinking about how do you not just get more people talking, but how do you see these networks allow leaders to do things uh, a little bit differently? And there's an awful lot of focus in most organizations around thinking about collaboration always from a more is better perspective. If you mention the word collaboration to some CEO somewhere, they're, you know, we need more of it, right? Then I'll immediately say, do you yourself want another email meeting or phone call in your life, right? Another thing to tack on that's going home to you with your Blackberries or other things like that. The reaction's almost always no. Um, and the reaction in most cases we're finding is that there is a really significant cost to not understanding, in this case, the cost of collaboration. To understand the amount of time these new matrix-based structures, the social media applications, things like that are actually driving uh, and taking from other activities and organizations. So I want to be a little bit uh, pragmatic here and I'm going to focus on uh, really thinking about what we see these ideas do in companies, right? That's more of my uh, focal point as opposed to the external areas. And I won't go through the story here. This is a major petrochemical organization. They were losing about $750 million because they weren't moving best practice as well across deep sea drilling rigs. Um, very common application for us to be thinking about how do you take these ideas internally and be able to assess the value of whether collaborations are moving that in this case were uh, decreasing cycle time in the drilling cycle, right? $350,000, $450,000 dollars a day every day they're drilling. So um, this organization, much bigger than the network I'm putting in front of you, about 4,000 people globally, um, but they came and said we'd like to do an assessment, get a sense of how we're collaborating. And on the left, what I'm showing you is the formal structure, same thing that Juan, a, a version of what Juan put up. On the right is the informal, that is, uh, there's a line between two people in this case, if one person says, this is an effective tie for me, right? This is somebody I rely on to be able to get my work done uh, in organizations. And I use this just to give you a flavor of, you know, very high level representation of the diagram. Usually there's a lot of other analytics, as, as Juan was pointing out. But there's a handful of characters that we always see in these companies or agencies, um, almost no matter what group we're looking at, whether it's a merger interface, uh, top 5,000 people in an organization, transition to a matrix-based structure, we can fairly universally expect 3 to 5% of the people to account for 20 to 35% uh, of the value added ties, right? So not just people that are talking over email or things like that, but people that are producing revenue together, um, moving best practices, actually uh, building value in the organization. So we're always interested in who those people are because if I look at who I'm showing is really critical to the organization and who is on the top talent lists uh, and is getting paid attention to, there's typically less than about a 50% overlap. Right? Or if you imagine applying this idea in a merger context and you're acquiring an entity based on the human capital there, there's a very unclear understanding of who the key people are. They'll go out and give retention bonuses to the people up here, but they won't be aware of these key people down deeper that they want to think about, about keeping. So we really care about the Mitchells of the world um, for a couple of reasons. Just as interested in, in the center is I'm very focused on the fringe and how do we get inclusion. Uh, whether it's capabilities we're trying to develop, innovations we're trying to generate, a lot of times you'll find that companies will decide they want to innovate on certain trajectories, hire the relevant skill sets, acquire the relevant companies, yet those points of expertise don't get influential in the network. Right? So they have the human capital in place, but the influence isn't being exerted in ways that drive innovation. It creates an innovator's dilemma kind of uh, trap there. Third, and you know, some people that others in the room are always interested in, are people uh, that are central in these networks, not because they know the most people, like a Mitchell, but because they sit at these inflection points, right? And there's various ways we can spend forever analyzing exactly how do you define that inflection point. But the main thing that I care about and most executives I work with care about is just that they have more bridging ties, more ties across functional lines, geographic distance, and that those people, if you get them to adopt a technology earlier, it tends to uptake it by about 20%. If you get them on the change teams earlier, you get greater acceptance and adoption of the programs. Um, they're kind of magical people that you want to be including and thinking about uh, early, but they're often not on the, uh, on the radar screen of the organizations. And then third for me is where you see uh, silos right in the organization. And for me, I'm never going back in to companies and saying, you need everybody connected to everybody else, because anybody could do that, right? We could go out in the woods and sing kumbaya to each other. We could you know, build another social media platform. We could throw another matrix dimension in it. Um, we could do certain things that indiscriminately promote it. But if we can be more targeted and see where these silos are happening, 
um, then we can be much more precise, right, in our interventions. And the reason that matters to me is because almost universally the silos are very different in different pockets of the companies, right? In some cases it's incentive schemes are out of alignment and a matrix dimension isn't going to fix that. In other cases, I'm sure you guys have never seen this in places you work, it's two leaders that don't like each other, right, that are driving silos into the hundreds. And again, a social media tool matrix isn't going to solve that. It requires kind of uh, targeted effort uh, at that juncture. So there's really, you know, pragmatic things that companies are doing to target different ways of making their organizations truly global, truly collaborative enterprises without just uh, layering on more collaboration indiscriminately without seeing it. What I want to focus in, and I want you to get me to, to think with me on this, I'm going to start putting some questions back to, back to you all on this for a second, are uh, the, the, the imbalance that we see in these networks. So universally, we can expect 3 to 5% of the people to account for 20 to 35% of the ties. Look at the 10%, usually that's 40 to 50% of the ties. Right? It's a very small set of people are a heavy, heavy focus for collaborative demands in the network. And then universally, we have certain people that we can't get included. Right? And in some strong culture companies, you go to a, you know, all the top companies out there, really, it can take three to five years to see people actually have impact in these networks, not just be on the organization, but, but be impactful. There are various things we can speed that, we can do to, to, to speed it up. But my point is most companies, if they say we need to be a global enterprise, they come in with one of two solutions these days. One is we need a matrix-based structure, right? We need another dimension, two, three dimensions that's going to get us to be collaborative overall. Yet the problem with that is as they implement it, it dramatically overloads these people and causes inefficiencies, and then oftentimes doesn't grab these people and get leverage on their abilities, unless the executives are, are looking at the network. And we can follow the implementation of these things and see all sorts of inefficiencies that happen. Same thing with the social media tools. Right? The other knee-jerk reaction, besides you know, we need to go have an offsite, the other knee-jerk reaction is we need a, a collaborative tool, right? so people can instantaneously get to each other. And you see the algorithms and all these that we've seen so far. The problem with them is they tend to make the popular more popular. Right? People put a search engine in there and they say, you know, you get positive votes, you get this and that. So you type something in as a newcomer and you're going to get Mitchell more, more often than not. And it tends to kind of progressively create a scenario where you have Mitchells of the world um, that the company suddenly becomes susceptible to losing, right? If they walk out the door and leave, that's a big hit you take in terms of the way they, not just their human capital, but how they affect the organization. Um, or they're overconsumed, right? They can't, uh, they can't answer people's, people's problems. Um, now, you can imagine a very different world, right? If and rather than doing these search algorithms such that the most popular person was picked, maybe they picked the 10th, right? Or they picked certain silos they were trying to bridge. And you could actually create much more intelligent kind of applications like that that I think we're, uh, we're pushing to. But you get the point that there's a, there's a real cost to not understanding the amount of time spent in organizations, not understanding where these uh, kind of inflection point people are that are slowing things down, oftentimes not uh, a product of their own, you know, intentions or things like that, but how they're, uh, how they're managing things. That make sense? We okay? So let me take you live with something, and I want to brainstorm a little bit how, you, how you'd solve this, um, what, what you think companies could do differently. Um, this should make perfect sense, right? In the, uh, in the, the heart of this, uh, you know, hairball, we lovingly refer to it, uh, is, and, and of course we don't just use these analytics to, to take back to organizations, but this is a guy that, um, very well-known organization, if I mentioned the name, everybody in the room would go, got it, you know, and, and, and the uh, guy here was running uh, this group, biotechnology group, and then three others that were of similar size, about 1,800 people in each place. His name Scott is disguised, I'll, I'll say, in the, in the thick of this thing, and Scott was a great guy. Right? He was somebody that everybody loved and wanted to be around. He'd come into the organization and he'd, for about four or five years, he'd been getting his you know, feet established and, and establishing kind of who he was. And then he was put on a new product development team that, um, that, that, that eventually produced the product that is their blockbuster. Right? It creates you know, a huge proportion of their revenue, the initial product, and then as they did gene stacking and other things, derivative products off of it. So he kind of flew through the ranks right? over 10, 15, 20 years, he progressively rode his reputation um, until he was promoted into this position and he was presumed to be the next CEO, right? Everybody thought this was just a, a staying point until he was promoted up. Now when we came in, the CEO asked us to do a, a look at the top 6,000 people in the organization to see decision-making effectiveness, could they speed new product introduction, things like that. And he pulled me aside and he said, you know, Scott, 
at, at one point we thought he was our next CEO, but right now he's pretty close to getting fired um, because he's not responsive, he's not able to keep up with different demands that are happening around him. And so when I took a look at him, it turned out he had well over, just in this group, well over 120 people coming to him frequently for information to, to get things done. And another uh, 78 that said, if I don't get more of his time, I can't hit my business goals. Right? So a different network dimension that we map around who do you need more of in these places to see where bottlenecks are happening. Um, and so, you know, Scott, and this was happening in this group and then a couple of other groups, he'd come in with all sorts of great collaborative philosophies. He'd implemented collaborative tools. He'd created an open door policy. He'd taken layers out of the structure so more people could be presumably more responsive. But what that does, if you're not paying attention to the network, is create an implosion right, on a small set of people. And so for him, we sat down and talked, and you know, he, was in a, he was in misery, right? He had health problems. He was up till 2 a.m. in the morning doing emails, back up at 6 a.m. He pre-diabetic, cholesterol issues, probably this close to a heart attack. He was describing family problems, right? Stress of this sort of stuff going home on Blackberries with him. Interactions at work were toxic. His subordinates were intimidated. They weren't coming through with good ideas because he was kind of snapping. Uh, his peers thought he was becoming, I'll let you infer the rest of that, but they weren't too happy with him either, and they weren't supportive of him and, and initiatives he was driving. So he was, you know, in a miserable position, and his unit was really suffering too. Right? From a performance perspective, they were missing a ton of innovations where people on the fringe couldn't get ideas through and get them kind of influential in what was going on. And they were missing growth opportunities in Asia, ranges of things like that where there were, there were biases uh, built in. It wasn't a product of him hoarding information or lack of tools. It was a product of overload in the network right? and it not being managed well uh, in terms of letting people get their work done. So let me tell you what he did. He, um, he sat back, there's three things you need to think about on this front. And I wanna talk about it first at the individual level and I'll come at the organizational level. One is analytically you can take this personal network assessment that we have and you can start to be very targeted actions around who's taking too much of my time, right? How am I, I'm not gonna dump this person out of my network but I can understand what activities are consuming too much of me and shift things to free things that way, to be analytical about kind of where your time is being spent uh, on that front. Second, he sat back and looked and said, okay, if I look over the course of the past three months, got my coach with me, and I look at all the meetings I'm a part of and who's coming after me for what, it turned out that about 20% of his collaborations and time demands were really routine things, stuff that two or three years ago he probably needed to answer but that had followed with him, right? People kept coming back to him for approvals or small informational requests. And so we could, we could systematically go in there and see where's all this happening and we could create other go-to people on certain things that slingshotted talent he cared about into the group. Uh, we could embed certain things into policy and procedure manuals. So like travel approvals in most places make it to ungodly heights, right? Nobody's even looking at them anymore. They're signing off because somebody 15 years ago made a mistake. You can start to understand the cost of that in here and say what thresholds do we want to consider, right? To make the, the group a little bit more efficient. So structurally he did things and then he stepped back and he said, okay, behaviorally, uh, what am I doing, right? And looking kind of lens on himself, what am I doing that's creating the enemy here? And behaviorally, you know, most of us are really, again, attuned to thinking that a good leader needs to be responsive, they need to answer questions quickly, they need to be accessible, all these sorts of things that works for a while but then creates a trap right around that leader. It derails careers we can see, overloads people, and it hurts the group when they're not accessible and can't, um, can't answer questions. So he, um, he did a range of things, right? He uh, began to start sending uh, people to meetings. Psychologically, this was really hard on him because he wanted to be in the know, right? He was up to 2 a.m., this close to a heart attack, but by God, it felt to be good in the thick of things, right? And he knew what was going on. So he had to think about how do I, how do I build capability underneath me? How do I start taking you know, opportunities to send others free up time and space? I uh, began to ask more questions and answer fewer um, behaviorally to kind of drive some of these uh, interactions down in the network. Um, he did a thing that I thought was particularly cool. He, everybody's seen this happen in your organizations where there's some issue that evolves over email and the leader, if they're copied on it, they have a tendency to jump in, right, and solve the problem. Let's say, you know, I know kind of what we need to do and then they oftentimes create more churn uh, than they don't really see uh, out there, but he would do this all the time. And so they did what I didn't know was possible. They sent him out to a camp in the woods and unplugged him for a week, right? Because he used to do this all the time. He'd been getting yelled at for quite some time. And he said it was like a heroin withdrawal, right? The first couple of days, he didn't have email, Blackberry, cell phones, anything like that. Um, um, but over the course of the week, he kind of survived. And what do, you, what do you think he did the first day he got back to the office? 
checked his email, right? Immediately back on email. And he's looking at emails that were seven days old, right? Thousands of them at this level going through it. And he sees an issue pop up and he viscerally, you know, he feels his face grow flush. He's, you know, pulse is accelerating. He's ready to jump in and solve it. Right, and then he manages to make it to day two, which is again six days ago, and realizes this thing has been solved just fine without him. Right, it, it's it's more about him and things that he was doing to uh, exert uh, influence in the network that was causing problems. So he did a range of things like this, and I won't uh, drag you through the weeds on all these different points, but there were a range of pretty subtle things that were geared towards creating space. Right, collaborative space for him, and then a focus around his team, and this kind of propagates down. Right, it's not just about one person. There are efforts you're taking to reduce collaborative demands deeper down, and for him, it had a had a great impact. Right, over the course of a year, you know, next time around he was number 17. Time after that, he was number 21, overloaded person in the network. So you're not trying to drive people completely out, but you're trying to situate the demands, the collaborative demands, in ways that make sense that allow the group to innovate. Uh, to get global scale, to do, uh, to do things like that overall. Does that make sense? Are we good? So I want you to pair up. This is the networking part of the show. And I, uh, I want you to tell me, somebody next to you, introduce yourself. Uh, try to find somebody you don't know. I know there's clustering that happens in this. But see if you can do this. Give me one idea. And I want the brain trust in this room to come up with five by the time I'm done. Uh, one idea on what can companies do not to think about collaboration and say, we need more but to be more intentional around reducing the excessive collaborative demands or those that aren't producing impact, right? And so I've thrown a couple of ideas up here. It can be technology, scheduling, staffing, formal you know, decision rights, things like that. But I want to pull a couple of ideas out, and then I want to tell you a little bit about where we're going with this idea, because I would say at least 50% of the work we do in companies now is not about how do we just layer on more collaborations, but about how do we see systematically what the cost of those that are, are happening, whether it's delayed innovation, actual time consumption, things like that. Okay? So you got to pair up, look in, make eye contact with somebody. You got two minutes for your best idea. Come up, uh, give me a couple ideas, just a couple of, couple of thoughts from back in the, uh, in the room here. What do you do if you look at collaboration and you think about it, not as a more is better, but you actually start thinking about the cost of it to some degree and the cost of over-inclusion, things like that in organizations. What do you do? Yep. Prepare a to-do list and chop 75% off it. Right. <laughs> so do less, chop 75% off it in terms of uh, uh, different interaction patterns potentially you can see or where that's consuming in different ways, right? What do you got? Just to build to that, just to focus on the critical Right. And so target in different things. But and then even, you know, we've been studying this for some time. We've been interviewing the what we call the efficient collaborators, right? The people that go out and actually create a lot of value and don't suck the life out of the organization. So all of us know those people. You see them coming down the hall and you're thinking, there goes an hour of my life, I'm never gonna get back, right? <laughs> and uh, and it turns out that you know, they do really subtle things differently um, in terms of when they define those things they're going after. They run the meetings differently. They, uh, they structure things in a way that are far more efficient, not just for themselves, but for the people that are involved, right? Not trying to be overly inclusive. They do things that, uh, that have big impact. So there's a range of things in terms of you know, tasks you go after and then how you're affecting others and the conscientiousness of that that can really promote greater, greater effectiveness on that front. What else? Give me one or two more here. Yep. Really? <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times we'll map these networks, and I'll, I'll do a lot with this idea called energy, right, uh, in organizations. So we'll map not just information flow, but who is creating enthusiasm. Basic question of when you interact with somebody, does it, how does it affect your energy level? Do you walk away more positive, more engaged in what's going on? Is it neutral, or do they just suck the life out of you, right, and, and the initiatives? You know, the people that drop a bomb in, in team conversations, whatever it may be. So there's a whole range of ways we can see that. And basically what we find is about 5% of the people in most organizations account for about 95% of the misery. There's a small set of the people, but, but if you can target them and either, either get around them or shift what they're doing, there's a range of efforts you can, you can go after and actually have a, have a big impact in different ways there. Yep. Put restrictive rules on email. Uh, right. Give your colleagues their lives back. 
Right. So, I mean, there's great things. I sit with most senior executives in all these companies. They have enormously cool tactics for thinking about how do we try to get control over email, right? The length of it, you know, the, the time it's used, um, getting in a stairwell and having a conversation on a periodic basis versus, you know, going to email. One of the things we know about the more collaboratively efficient people, and leaders in particular, is they're very quick to move off of email to a more rich medium when, when they sense something's wrong, right? Rather than persist and kind of let it propagate. Uh, they're much more effective and targeted in how they do that to get, get alignment out there. Yep. Right, meetings and then the attendees at the same time, right, is a really big deal. And we'll see this with the pharma companies as an example, where they're equating a day lost and, and getting something to market as a huge cost. You can start to really factor that in, right, figure out who really needs to be involved in this decision. Pharma companies are phenomenal to me because they make one or two big decisions every now and then, but it permeates over into everything, you know, from travel approvals to hiring to slight promotions, things like that. That over-inclusiveness is something you can kind of target and, and quantify economically there. Right, right, who needs to be there? So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go out and map decision-making networks. We'll say, who do you turn to for input or approval prior to making a certain decision? And then we'll say, you know, what are those decisions, right? And I'll give you an example of that in a second. Or what was that person's role in the decision? And it's really stunning. We'll say, okay, this person kind of is a decision maker. This person needs to be informed. And then you get these categories like this person just wants to know. This person's been around forever and we got to talk to them. And that takes huge amounts of time, right? And if you can start pruning that back, it can, can have a really big effect on, on uh, speeding, uh, speeding how things get done there. Um, so you get the idea, right? There are ways that we can go in and measure these networks, not just in terms of who's talking to whom. The typical strategy that we often talk about with these networks, and let me get back to this basic idea again, is how do we target this guy, right? If you're looking at, at kind of the sales side of what we do, the commercialization side, you want to know who these guys are because if you can market to them, you can do certain things through them, or McWaters, you can get a lot done, right? Same thing in companies. In a selective basis, if you can understand who these people are, you can diffuse a technology, you can get a cultural transformation done, you can do certain things more effectively. But there's also a real cost to per perpetually overloading these people. Right? And so one of the most common things I see is companies will go through a restructuring and they have these people that are way overwhelmed in the organization and because they're popular, they're then the next most thought of person for the next committee, right? Or the next initiative or whatever. And it just kind of creates a, you know, a real problem point there. So at a personal level, one of the ways we can do things about that, we've written a paper as, as uh, Juan was talking about, uh, Peter who will talk about some of these ideas later too and I have been focused on what specifically do more efficient people do? What are the practices that organizations can begin to leverage from a structural standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint? And that'll be coming out fairly soon um, at more of an individual level to think about you know, collaboration, not from a more is better perspective because we've been at it for about 15 years and I've been able to track successful people over time, those people that get in and stay in that top 20% performance category. And it used to be that they were completely defined by building bridging ties right, the, the non-redundant information stuff we've heard about in this room before. But far more now, are they're, they're more and more defined by strategies that push down collaborative demands, being intentional about managing collaboration so they're not getting overwhelmed and, and creating space around themselves. See the same thing at, a, at an organizational level. So I want you to help me solve this problem, okay? This is a um, major company we've worked with for years and years and years in uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and this head of uh, R&D in this case had come to me. This is a while back, so I can, I can present it and talk about it. Uh, he'd come to me and he said, um, uh, you know, we, we are not able to get things to market as efficiently as we want. And there's a huge cost to, to doing that. And we should be. We have the right base of science. We have more resources despite certain recalls. We have plenty of financial resources to, uh, to go about doing this. They'd spent a lot of money, right, on a consulting firm. They'd come in and they'd done their formal, you know, processes. And they'd, they'd align decision rights. And everything was perfect, right, from a process perspective. So that decisions were right where they needed to be. And the, there should have been just a flow of, you know, new products and things like that. But the cultural reality of this place was anytime somebody got a decision that they didn't like, they just elevated it, right? And they kept elevating it until they got the answer they want. And so it was a scenario where um, culture was trumping structure, right? The, the structure looked clean, made a lot of sense, but they still weren't getting the speed to market that they'd been hoping for. So rule group in this case is about 10,000 people. I'm just showing you the, 
a quick scatter plot here of the top uh, 1%, kind of the operating committee for this leader. And we'd gone out to a, an offsite, and they were using these ideas to think about, you know, what are the drugs that are not getting to market quick enough? How do we speed that by understanding this in the network? But one of the things I was showing them was I said, just, let's just look at the top, you know, roughly 100, just you guys in the network. And on this axis, I'm showing the number of times somebody sought out for information. So person one up here was sought out 71 times just out of this 100-person group, right? It doesn't include all the people in his unit that was coming to him. 71 times for information uh, frequently. And then on this axis, it's again that same idea. Who, who do you need greater access to to be effective, right? Greater contact with to hit your business goals. And you find that 27 people needed even more of him, right, to be effective and hit their goals for the, for the coming year. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So it's demand, and then who needs even more here? Um, and you don't go to somebody like this and say, you need to work harder, right? Because you know, he's up at all hours and, and pushing in different ways. Um, but it's a real issue. And they've invested tremendous amounts of money to try and streamline, make things more efficient. But the bottlenecks are existing, not in the formal processes and structures, but in the network, right? And thinking about how do you, how do you shift that around. What do you do? You're the leader of this organization for a second, right? You spend a boatload of money on this trying to solve it, and you see something like this. What do you, what do, you do? What's the, what's the solution? This is where my ability to outweigh long, uncomfortable silences will stun you. Just give me a couple of thoughts, a couple of ideas here. Yep. Right. 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 So one thing you want to do is, if it's driven by that, the base idea you want to understand is what's driving this pattern, right? What is it that people are seeking out from this person? And if you find that it's ego related, then it's potentially coaching or it could be other things. You start moving this person around. Now this person actually turned out to be a great guy. He was somebody that everybody loved. He was an icon in the organization, but he'd been getting yelled at for probably five years to delegate, right? That's the classic thing you do. You got to delegate. And so when he would go out and delegate, he'd go out and delegate to this guy, right, the very next most busy person in the network. And you would see this kind of spike moving around, right? It wasn't actually getting solved in terms of stopping the delays in there. It was just kind of shifting depending on what's going on in there. So what we see and, and ways we've actually had a really good success on driving this into organizations is, again, not trying to speed things up by another tool meeting, more people included. But rather, we'll go up to these guys when it's structural, right? And you can see it's a seeking up the hierarchy here. And we'll ask them a handful of questions. The company does this usually um, with coaches or other things. We'll say, what information, routine information, are people coming to you for, right, that could be made accessible in other formats, websites, other things like that? What ru routine decisions are you approving that you don't need to be a part of? And then are there portions of your role you can let go of? All right, so three things, information, decisions, and role. And what we find is if we can shift those three ideas um, down in the network, we find people that are um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, in the lower quadrant here, um, we can make them a go-to person on pricing, right? Or we can find tactical things that we shift responsibilities down to. It, it can have a magical effect, right? It delayers the overly connected, and you're not asking them to give up strategically important things. You're not saying, I'm going to take something that's, that matters to you to, to do your work. It's routine things that kind of free time. And then really importantly is you're, you're using it not to delegate down this way, but to find people down here that you're trying to get included. Right? So this company had a horrendous track record. They'd hire experienced people in, and after about 18 months, most of them quit because it just was a horrendous place to try and figure out in the, in the network. But what they found is if they could give them certain points of responsibility, you could actually slingshot those people in. Right? You could improve the retention of the talent. Um, you could improve the effectiveness that they were, they were having on the organization. Um, does that make sense? Yeah? Right. In terms of responsibilities or? Right. And that, you know, more often I see that when we're looking at the de-energizers, right, in there or different dimensions. We'll kind of stack in here and see, you know, where are the, the costs of certain people too great, right? And there may be certain kind of shifts that are done. But the magic of this to me is that we're not asking, we're not asking this person to, to move, right? It's not a restructuring. We're identifying information, routine decisions, portions of the role and shifting that. And that we find that that tends to be much more effective in terms of um, not getting resistance or things, things like that.
That make sense? Yeah. So here's the thing, it never works. If I do just this, it never, it'll go for a little while, right? But then it'll, it'll kind of progressively get worse, more bottlenecked, you know, over time. It'll, it'll kind of settle out and then, and then go back like this. Why do you think that is? What's that? What's that? Right, behavior change, leaders don't want to let go. Some of the things you're actually talking about, do you get rid of the person? Yeah. Right, and so there may be a culture in certain ways that's been created in this context. Um, and this is one of the biggest things that was happening here and in most of the pharma uh, organizations we're in. You can actually go coach the leaders. It's easy to label this as the leader's problem um, and say they're not letting go or whatever it may be. Um, but, and you, you have to address that, but more often than not, it's also the followers issue, right? So it's all these hundreds of interactions because they've been trained never to make a decision on their own one way or the other. They have hundreds of interactions where they say, gosh, I'm just checking with you or I just need to know about this or that sort of thing. And it drives the, the leader back right into this unproductive position um, because of you know, a culture right, that's there. So what we find is if we can get you know, both the leader and the follower in the room, we create what they kind of laughingly call a Weight Watchers agreement with me, where the leader says, you know, here's five things that I'm not going to ask about. You got to have an informational loop, so I'm OK. And here's five things that you're going to take courageous action on. Right, and so it's not a, a, a misstep then in terms of the, the propensity to kind of drive back. Yep. Um, do you see like an oscillation where an Right. And are they going to be kind of playing themselves up for five years? Right. So, I, you know, from my perspective, again, there's, I'm not, and I'm smart enough not to say the name of the company now, but there's a, a major consulting firm that is out there, and they're hawking this idea of, uh, they, I won't mention the name of it either, but they've got a formal alignment methodology. And they come in and they say, you know, span of control needs to be eight or nine or some magic number that they then go out and charge hundreds of millions of dollars on to, to present to these people. Um, and, and what we find is when you look in the network, they, so they go in and they start pulling people out and moving people around just based on the formal chart, and it creates these phenomenal overload points right in the network if you're not looking at this well. Or same thing with the process reengineering efforts. A lot of times I follow the process redesigns and you find the people that were popular in the old environment suddenly are way overwhelmed in the new because they got all the old guys and the new guys coming to them. Uh, if we have this data, you can manage that, right? So in, in very targeted ways, I'm showing you guys as we go here, dots and arrows of people you don't know or care about, but you can imagine how this kind of jumps off when it's your group, right? You start to understand what do I need to do? How do I get, uh, get inclusion there? So, so I do think the overload has potential to, to shift like that. We good? So one idea, if you, yep, what do we got? I was just wondering, what if, when you start putting faces to them, the, the people in that lower left quadrant, yep. do, do they perceive themselves as kind of unimportant in this? I mean, nobody's coming to me for information, and nobody's needing me more. Right. Does so, that mean I ought to be looking elsewhere? So a lot of times what down here, uh, you know, sometimes it's the attorneys, right? I'm sure there's attorneys in the room, but. <laughs> But sometimes it's role driven, you know. <laughs> um, but a lot of times it has a hell of a lot more to do with, again, the culture of the company and the poor onboarding processes, right? So they, they, all these organizations out there, they have these fantastic, you know, onboarding processes that have nothing to do with getting somebody well positioned in the network and not getting them influential in how things get done. So typically what we find is these are more kind of low tenure issues and we can slingshot them in. If we staff them in certain ways, we give them our initial assignments in the first to six months, we can do a lot to help that company get more productivity you know, out of that group. So there's a range of, range of things down there. And again, leaders kind of look at this and they go, huh, you know, they're surprised by a number of these people and they, they have different kind of targeted action points there. So. Okay. So, Take this, there, there's reasons that you care about this because you can quantify the cost of you know, collaboration, right? You can quantify the cost of over-inclusion, excessive hierarchy, measuring the lost days to getting something to market. Uh, you can actually measure the interaction time in these networks and start to, to give people a sense of the amount they consume. There's nothing I like more than doing one of these things where we've also measured time consumption in the network and going back to the leaders and say, do you have any clue how much you cost this place? in terms of the way you're you know, demanding information, the way you're running governance structures that um, you haven't really been able to see before uh, on the cost side.
side there. The other big cost of it, and this has again kind of evolved over you know five or six year period as we've been through the recession, fewer people doing more work, uh, the collaborative tools, the matrix structures, is the overload and the, the demand that that places on the individual employee, right, and, and from an engagement standpoint. So same idea here is that we're looking at uh, who needs greater connectivity to this person, and this is you know, the number of times they're sought out, right? So you got demand on this side, you got the degree to which people need more on that dimension. And then here we're, we're coloring the bubble sizes by their relative happiness if you will, so their engagement scores, right? So big means you're more engaged, more career satisfied, you're kind of happy in what you're up to. Small means not so much, right? You're, you're not that kind of engaged or happy. Does that make sense? So if you, if you track with me, the, it, you know, generally you see this trend where people need to be inside companies and kind of included to be engaged and, and you know, happy. Usually these guys are brand new and so they're engaged, just happy to be there. If you, if you start factoring in tenure, but the more troubling thing is up here, right? And almost in every place, it happens at different points. But we see this inflection point where people start to get overwhelmed. They can't keep up. They have too many demands coming at them. Work's going home with them, other things like that. And they start to get less engaged, right? And what we're seeing is we can really develop some neat predictive models on this to understand who are you. Because the last people you want to lose are these guys, right? They're, they're heavily informationally sought. They're, people need more access to them but they're also the most likely to leave a lot of times. Um, and we can find them and you can do certain things to shift demands off of them, right, and retain talent in ways that um, traditionally leaders haven't been able to, to see or think about out there. Okay, so costs kind of on, on, on two fronts there. Um, and I'll also say the, the one thing I meant to say on the, on the last slide, on the cultural front, uh, one of the things we've been doing in many of these places recently is mapping a network. I'll map energy to see kind of where enthusiasm is. It has a huge deal to do with leader success over time, huge deal to do with where innovations are emerging and pockets in the organization. But more and more we've been mapping this network of fear, if you will. So not, you know, am I physically scared of Larry or kind of intimidated on a physical front, but when I'm in meetings or interactions, do I hold back? Right? Do I not share kind of cutting edge ideas, what I'm thinking? And, and you see these incredibly dense networks where the human capital is in place, but the culture's been created for whatever reason that those ideas aren't getting expressed right? and, and, and advanced in different ways. And again, you, know, you can put a, what we call a, a cost to fear to understanding where you're not getting kind of leverage out of the, uh, out of the workforce. So first point for me, three ideas at the organizational level, three ideas is one is where are the Mitchells, right, that are invisibly slowing you down and invisibly hurting productivity, oftentimes by no fault of their own, right? It's ways things have, have migrated around them that you can find ways to push down, improve the effectiveness of your organization, improve their effectiveness. Second is then, as I said, we will map decision-making networks to see um, how much time people are spending uh, interacting with others around decisions, and then we'll partition that in the assessment to see which of these interactions are around strategically important things, right? And so about markets we're going into or the kinds of things that really should be in conversations. And then which of these interactions are around routine interactions, routine decisions? Then we'll ask people, tell us, you know, which of these decisions, what are these decisions that are taking too much time on a routine basis? Things that you just shouldn't be consulting 1,800 people on, right, for a travel approval or a hiring advancement or whatever it may be. Um, and then we can quantify that. People type in what those decisions are, and you can start to see, um, you know, the, the, the basic idea that happens in all places we're in, in, in heavily pharma, is somebody made a mistake 10 years ago on something small, and it becomes policy, right? And it becomes a cost for everybody to follow. What we can do is then isolate those out and think about, you know, how do we shift decision rights in a very targeted way? How do we potentially alter processes or policies um, that can have an effect of streamlining the group? right, and improving efficiency. And usually these costs equate to about 20% of the amount of time spent in the network, right? So the first thing we're going after is where are the overload points? How do we shift that down? Second thing is where are the unnecessary collaborations happening? You know, the things that are making it to leaders, they're not even looking at it anymore. They're just signing off on it. But it's consuming everybody's time. It's losing delays. It's doing other things that hurt the organization uh, in that process. And you can find that and, and pull that out. That make sense? We good? And then the third point for me, 
is um, we look for the, uh, the, the more efficient collaborators. So what I'm looking at here, a different organization, and on one axis, I'm showing uh, the number of times the individual, each of these dots are people, right? Uh, number of times the individual um, provided benefit to their colleagues. Or number of times they were claimed as important, as helpful, as you know, somebody that helped me get my work done, not just uh, somebody that, that talks a lot. And then on this axis, I'm looking at the, uh, the total amount of time they take. So we'll literally measure that in the network. We'll say, how much time do you spend preparing for and in interaction with this person? And we can plot that and see who are the people that are pretty much who are more efficient, right? They provide a lot of value back, but they don't consume a lot of time uh, to, the, to the group overall. And then we can kind of find the time suckers too, right? Those people that, you know, for not a heck of a lot of value, take a hell of a lot of time uh, in the organization. And it's not like I'm interested in who they are, really. Uh, we don't necessarily go after certain people this way and say, you need to stop talking to people or things like that. Um, but what I'm really interested in is we can go and um, uh, uh, we find that if we can typically get this group, the group that's in this qu upper quadrant, just to adopt some of the practices that this group is doing, the FTEs are typically in about a 15% interval, right? We can save about 15% FTEs equivalent of time in looking at that. And there's subtle things. If we had more time and we were kind of brainstorming it as a group, we'd go into meeting management practices, email, way you set expectations. I mean, just kind of tactical items um, that other people can, can adopt and, and have impact on. And again, it adds up, right? If you can actually take those amounts of time out of the network, uh, you're able to make the group more efficient um, over time, more systematically. So, you know, one, one example uh, of this and one of the major bio uh, biopharma organizations as we plotted this out for all their first line leaders as an example in the organization, people that had just moved up from being individual contributors to running groups for the first time. These guys are technically brilliant, but they have the social skills of a gnat, right, typically. And they, they kind of don't think about much about how they affect others, the way they frame things, the way they organize meetings, things like that. And so you had huge variance between the effectiveness of the more effective frontline leaders and the less effective in terms of how they were consuming the group, but then also the, the effectiveness of what they were doing, their cycle time and, uh, and things like that. So you know, we brought everybody into a room. There's a whole boatload of them out there. And we gave them little reports on their, each of their teams so they could see how their team was not just connected internally, but leveraging the external uh, out, out there. And then we paired all the tables. So we put some you know, people that were time suckers at the table with some people that were very efficient. Right? We didn't tell them who they were right? and didn't kind of lay that out. Um, but then they would sit and talk a little bit about it. They'd say, OK, here's the collaborations that my team is managing. Um, here's where we're missing. We have certain external blind spots that we need to focus on. And then create some space so that these kind of best practices start getting shared right? from the more efficient to the less efficient. And we'd capture that and kind of uh, share it back out amazingly effective at getting the people you know, to think about these just small practices that have impact in that, that context, right, in that culture. And um, again, we can do a post-assessment on this. We have. We see that it, it has a dramatic effect in streamlining the, the efficiencies of the, of the group overall. Okay, so that was, uh, that was it for me. And I, I can take maybe a couple of questions here if there are any, any quick thoughts on applications and organizations. But base ideas as an individual um, we can see where these traps are starting to accrue around people uh, because they're not managing their own connectivity effectively. And we know that there are certain things that really derail careers. Uh, if you allow insularity to breed around you, you have too many demands coming at you, it's a real strong predictor that you won't be promoted you know, in the next interval as we track things. Same thing in companies. We can see um, at least these ways, and there's probably more that we'll uncover as we go, but at least in terms of driving down the overload points in the network, taking out the unnecessary interactions as much as we can, and then behaviorally finding ways for people to be more efficient in how they're engaging others has a you know, very significant quantifiable impact if you start you know, looking at the time reduction and the cycle time you know, improvements that you get there. So any, um, what do we got? Couple minutes. Sure. Any thoughts, uh, questions, things you're thinking about with your organization? I usually take silence as a good thing in my house. Okay, way in the back there. <laughs> yep. Right. Um, I think you can, it depends on what you're going after here. I, so I think this is, and, and somebody else raised the issue earlier. You know, I think in the, the state of flux most organizations are in today, there's, I can't come to you and say what 
we'll be doing in five years. You know what I mean? That, it, that it'll stick in five years. But what we've done is we've spent a lot of time to streamline the diagnostic process in here so that, you know, on an annual basis, people, a lot of people are using this. They include it with their balanced scorecard. They do other things so they can see where these pockets of problems are reemerging, right, over time. Um, but then the way you make it stick is you embed it in, in the way roles are defined, the, where decision rights are allocated. Um, you can change performance review processes. You embed certain practices that you're looking for that way, right, in terms of HR mechanisms, things like that. And it makes it stick for a short period of time. Then you, you, know, you face that issue of when conditions change, you're going to have new poppage points, right, like that. Um, so it's not a, I can't come here and say I can fix you for a decade. I would say, you know, we can kind of go year to year, every other year, and have some really great improvements, uh, you know, doing things that way. Anything else? Yep. Right. Right. Yeah, I think um, there are, so you go to, there's certain companies, I won't name the names, but there's certain companies that create that kind of space, you know, um, that you can see, we've been in these organizations, you can see in particular from an innovation standpoint when those are building more bridging ties. So you have people going across unit, that tends to be where the innovations really happen a lot of places, so you're not just getting incremental uh, stuff. Um, Procter & Gamble used this uh, years and years ago. They were struggling with just incremental innovation, and so they used this to see they're about a 10,000 person R&D group, and um, they, were, they were then focusing on how do we staff our ideation sessions very differently. Rather than take the people that are popular within one technical discipline that are going to protect their turf, they started pairing brokers, people that knit groups, right, and the, the more central people together. And because it, then they, they'd send them out to this gym. I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but they have these great facilities, you know, they, that, uh, that promote ideation. You get cush balls and all these little toys, and you can shoot basketballs and stuff like that. So they had the great facilities for it, but they found they were putting the wrong people in it, right, um, at, at first. But when they thought about the network a little bit more and they could create the right patterns there um, and then build that time in, then it, it seemed to work. So, so there are things like that. Uh, other places that practice, you know, significant rotation programs, like a GE, they have very rich networks across lines. Um, and, and so you do definitely see things like that. We good? All right. Well, let me thank everybody for the time. I appreciate it. <laughs>